This is the Unit 4 AP Microeconomics Review. So in Unit 4, we covered the three market structures of monopolistic competition, oligopolies, and monopolies. We're first going to cover monopolistic competition. Monopolistic competition is similar to perfect competition, just more realistic. Because remember we said perfect competition was too idealistic. You have a scenario with a ton of firms producing the exact same product with the exact same price in the real world very often. But monopolistic competition still has a ton of firms, but now they're selling products that are similar, yet not identical. And those slight product differences gives the producers a little bit of control over price. So it makes it into a more real world scenario. And we see these in markets that have a ton of firms selling a product like retail. There's a ton of different producers that sell jeans and those slight product differences, style, brand, length, separates the prices. So with that, we don't have the same graph as perfect competition because they are not 100% price takers as they were in perfect competition. So we will not have the two side by side graphs. Instead, now the producer has some control. So instead of a horizontal demand line where the consumers and the producers were price takers, we now have a downward sloping demand line. Also in perfect competition, price was the same as marginal revenue. Not the case anymore either. Now we have marginal revenue always falling below the demand line. And this is because with a downward sloping demand line, if a producer is going to sell a larger quantity as a, at a lower price as they move down along the line, when they're down here, they have to sell all the previous quantities at the lower price as well, which is why the marginal revenue for the firm will always fall below the demand line. We still have average total cost and we still have the marginal cost curve intersecting at the minimum of average total cost. But what we notice is although this is monopolistic competition in long run equilibrium, which was similar to perfect competition in long run equilibrium, it is not at the same point that it was in perfect competition, which illustrates again that this is going to be an imperfect market. So with monopolistic competition, how we determine profit maximizing quantity and the price a monopolistically competitive firm will charge, we use that idea that marginal revenue equals marginal cost determines the profit maximizing quantity, which here we see that as right here. But the monopolistically competitive firm doesn't charge this as their price as they would in perfect competition. Instead, they're going to charge the max price the consumer is willing to pay. So they're going to go up from their profit maximizing quantity to where that point hits the demand curve. And that over to the Y is going to determine the selling price for a monopolistically competitive firm. This is going to be very, very similar to the monopoly graph we're covering later in this review. And we notice that if we were in perfect competition, the perfectly competitive firm would sell a larger quantity. They would sell at this quantity here at the minimum of ATC, which is known as the efficient scale, but they're not selling at that quantity. They're selling at a lower quantity of monopolistic competition. And what the difference between perfect competition and monopolistic competition is known as is excess capacity. It's the quantity that we would have been selling in perfect competition, but since we're now imperfect, we're selling it below where we should be. This also illustrates how a monopolistically competitive firm, even in long run equilibrium, is not allocatively or productively efficient. We are not producing, even though we're at long run equilibrium at the minimum of the ATC, and we're also not producing where price equals marginal cost. And where price equals marginal cost, that difference between where we would be in perfect competition and where we are in monopolistic competition is what's known as markup cost. In perfect competition, we sell where price equals marginal cost. However, as I said now, the monopolistically competitive firm has some market power, so their, their price is above marginal cost, which is above where we want to be to be at the socially optimum price. And that difference between the two is known as markup cost. So with this idea of firms being in long run equilibrium, there's no real incentive for the government to regulate this firm. If they wanted to force the producer to charge this price here, 
the price would be below average total costs and the firm would be operating at a loss and they wouldn't be able to stay in business. So the government allows this firm to operate at long run equilibrium, even though it's not socially efficient, because at long run equilibrium, the firm is making zero economic profit. So they're still making enough to stay in business, but they're not making any economic profit. So there's no incentive to regulate them. Now, this is where the firm is similar to perfect competition. The reason why this firm ends up in long run equilibrium, just like in perfect competition, is because of the entry and exit of firms into the market. So in perfect competition, when a firm was making short run profits, it gave incentive for other firms to enter into the industry, increasing the supply and lowering the price back down to long run equilibrium. Same exact idea, but it looks different and a little bit different because demand is downward sloping conceptually as well. So if this firm was making short run profits, give other firms incentive to enter into the market, just like perfect competition. However, how that would affect this individual firm is if more firms entering into the market, that would decrease the demand for this individual firm, which would drive the price down if the demand falls. Cause again, we determine the price based on where it intersects demand. And if the price was making short run profits, but the demand decrease, decreases the price, it would drive it back to long run equilibrium. Same would work for if a firm was making short run losses. In perfect competition, when a firm was making short run losses, other firms would exit the industry and that would drive price back up in the market. Same idea, but again, a little bit different. If this firm was making short run losses, other firms would exit the industry and it would then increase the demand for this one individual firm. And if the demand increases, because then consumers don't have as many choices of whom to buy from, if the demand increases, that would drive up the price the monopolistically competitive firm would charge, and it would drive it back to long run equilibrium. So it's the same exact idea as perfect competition, that the entry and exit of firms always brings the economy back to this, what I've drawn here, a monopolistically competitive firm in long run equilibrium. The difference is, instead of drawing a market graph with supply and demand moving and supply entering and leaving firms, we now have the demand for the individual firm going up or down based on how much competition the firm has from other industries. The next market structure I want to talk about is monopoly. Monopolies are different from monopolistic competition, but the graph ends up actually being extremely similar. And a lot of the same exact ideas apply. In fact, it sets up just like a monopolistically competitive graph. So I don't need to go over why is demand downward sloping and marginal is downward sloping. It's the same reason monopolistically competitive demands and marginal revenues were downward sloping. But it's different because it's a market structure with only one producer which even in a free market economy, we see monopolies as inefficient because that one producer erodes competition, gets rid of competition. So this is one of the rare scenarios, scenarios where we do want the government to regulate a monopoly because free market competition doesn't exist when there's only one producer. So we see that in this scenario, we are still determining profit maximizing quantity where marginal revenue equals marginal cost and still determining the price based on where that intersects the demand line and over just like monopolistic competition. And a monopolist may or may not be making economic profit or loss, most likely profit though, because they have complete control over an industry. One important concept that goes back to elasticity, they ask about a lot on the monopoly graph, is which portion of the demand curve are you on when you are moving down along a monopoly's demand curve? And this goes back to unit one elasticity, a linear demand curve, where there are actually three ranges of elasticity as you move down along the linear demand curve. The top portion, and we determine this by where marginal revenue is positive, the top portion of the demand curve is the elastic portion of the demand curve. And why this is significant, in the elastic portion of a demand curve, if a firm raises price, total revenue goes down or if a firm lowers price, total revenue goes up. So knowing elastic or inelastic can have several different important thoughts that go with it. Where marginal revenue intersects zero, that point on the demand curve is the unit elastic portion. So it's not inelastic or elastic, it's right in the middle. And then when marginal revenue is negative, 
that portion, the bottom portion of the demand curve, is the inelastic portion of the demand curve. And why this is significant, again, we determine total revenue based on what portion of the demand curve you're on. So if price were to increase on the inelastic portion of the demand curve, total revenue would increase. Or if price were to decrease on the inelastic portion of the demand curve, the total revenue would decrease. So the monopolist needs to know which part of the demand curve they are charging a price on, because that will directly determine how a price change will affect total revenue. A monopoly graph is also different from monopolistic competition because that process of in entry and exit of firms and driving along an equilibrium doesn't exist. This is the only firm. There is no market to compare it to. So whatever is happening on this one graph, that's how it'll stay unless the government interferes which we see when we look at a regulated monopoly curve. So this is a regulated monopoly curve, a curve with a fixed marginal cost. So it looks a little bit different. You don't typically ever have to draw this curve on the AP exam, but they do like to ask about the three prices I have labeled here, because this is the three different scenarios a government can choose from when looking at a monopoly and how to regulate it. So if they didn't regulate a monopoly, if they let the monopoly exist in its own market, the price the monopolist char would charge is right here. Now this price is really high, above where we want in perfect competition. So the government, if they were to charge a lower price, make monopolists charge a lower price, they have two options. They could charge the social efficient quantity, which is where price equals marginal cost. But the problem with that is that we notice the price would then be below average total cost. So if the government forced the monopoly to charge the socially optimal quantity and price, the firm would go under and the monopoly wouldn't exist anymore. And if it's a natural monopoly that just exists more efficiently when there's only one firm, we don't want to get rid of the industry completely. So what the government tends to do is charge the fair returns price. This is a price that is lower than the monopolist would charge, but still to where the monopolist could stay in business. Because we notice it is at the point it intersects average total costs. So the firm is breaking even, and it's not all the way to socially efficient, but it's a lot closer than if it was charging just the straight monopolist price. The last market structure doesn't have a graph that you need to know on the AP exam. Instead, in an oligopoly where a few large firms dominate the industry, we looked at game theory. So oligopoly and monopolistic competition are the two imperfectly competitive markets. The difference is oligopolies has a, have a few large firms that are very, very interdependent. The decisions on one affects the price and the quantity the entire market will sell. So we see this with game theory, how you have to take in mind what your competitor is going to do when making every single decision. Now we look at game theory in this class as just a duopoly with two people, two countries, two businesses choosing between two options. And we look at, based on what the other one is going to do, how am I going to make my decision? To illustrate game theory, I have a basic prisoner dilemma problem, which was created under this idea if two people accused of a crime are in interrogation, they have the choice to confess or not to confess, and their sentence is determined by what the other person does, illustrating again that interdependence in an oligopoly market. So with that, if Paul and Adam have the choice to confess or not confess, Paul is going to look at what Adam's going to do to determine what he should do and say, does he have a dominant strategy, which is he will do something regardless of what Adam does. So if Adam were to confess, Paul would confess as well because he'd get eight years instead of 20. If Adam does not confess, Paul still has the strategy to confess because he'd be going free versus one year in prison. So Paul has a dominant strategy to confess, because no matter what Adam's going to do, he is going to confess. He'll come off better in both scenarios. Let's look at Adam. So he's gonna look, and if Paul confesses, Adam has the strategy to confess as well, because eight is less than 20, versus if Paul does not confess, Adam still has the strategy to confess, because he would go free versus getting one year. So what we notice is that both prisoners have a dominant strategy to confess. And that's the first qualification of a prisoner's dilemma scenario. They most, must both have a dominant strategy.
Second qualification for a prisoner's dilemma is that that dominant strategy cannot be the best thing overall for the players. So the best thing overall for the players in this scenario is for neither of them to confess. So they may collude, they may try and convince each other not to confess because it would help them both overall. But the problem is once until they get into that room and they think, well, if I just confess, I could potentially go free. And if I decide to remain silent but the other person confesses, that would still mean I would serve a longer term. Why would I agree to that collusion? So this illustrates that both Paul and Adam, although their best scenario overall is to stay silent, since they both have a dominant strategy to confess, that's what they're going to do. And they're both going to end up serving eight years because of that. Illustrating that collusion doesn't work very well because both players have to agree to the set output which if their dominant strategy doesn't follow that, why would, they fit? why would they go to that set output? Now, it may not always be a prisoner's dilemma. This is one specific type of problem. You may have a situation where only one player has a dominant strategy. So if only one has a dominant strategy, it cannot be a prisoner's dilemma scenario, or if both players' dominant strategy is the best thing for society overall, that also can't be a prisoner's dilemma. If at least one player has a dominant strategy though, you can find what's known as Nash equilibrium. Nash equilibrium is you know what the other player is going to do, which makes sense because if the other player has a dominant strategy, you know what that other player is going to do regardless of what you do. And so you're going to behave according to that other person's dominant strategy. So Nash equilibrium, you can still find which one the players are going to decide as long as one of the players have a dominant strategy because then you're going to behave according to that other player's dominant strategy. Now those are the two types of problems we look at and we're really just keeping it in a duopoly so it'll just stay with two choices and two players. And other than that, oligopolies we don't graph on the AP exam so just knowing that they're interdependent that they could collude, which when they do collude, they essentially act like a monopoly, which is why collusion is illegal in America. But collusion doesn't always work because a player will always stick to their dominant strategy. And that is the end of the Unit 4 AP Microeconomics Review.